Thank you. All right, stand back up. Now sit, no, I'm just kidding. Um, sit back down. No. Wow, Steve Witten on the electric. He's not standing. No, I'm just kidding. I want us to stand for a moment uh, because I would love for us to actually take a second to pray, okay? We're going to start this a little differently. Are y'all cool with different? All right? Y'all flexible today? Blessed are the flexible. If you've ever been on the mission field, blessed are the flexible. So put your hand on somebody next to you. Has anyone else just felt hungry? Whew. If there is one response to the heart with everything going on in our nation and at Asbury, the gate, at all these places, it's been this hunger, this groaning, this longing. And I said this Friday night at the worship night, but we have this challenge of both when we come to Jesus, when we come to Holy Spirit, it's like encountering the most familiar friend. Yeah, it's like encountering him for the first time. And it's, it's not either or, it's both hand. And so I'd love for us just to take a second before I jump into this preach and to pray for hunger. Come on, pray the dangerous prayer over your neighbor for hunger. That hunger would arise in their home. That hunger would arrive in their kids. That hunger would arrive in their families. That hunger would arrive in their unsaved family members. Father, would you increase our hunger? Would you increase our longing? Would you increase our desire for you? Holy Spirit, come on, pray over them like you'd want to be prayed for. Come on, keep going just a little longer. Yeah, Lord, would you dust off the the places of our hearts that have grown tired and weary. Jess and I were praying last night together and we were just praying that simple prayer, Lord, blow on the coals of our hearts. Increase the fire in our hearts. Increase the desire in our lives. Lord, make us long long for you. Make us hungry for you. Make us desperate for you, God. God, that we wouldn't lose the wonder in the familiarity. We wouldn't lose the excitement in the familiarity. But God, we would be excited every time we enter your temple, every time we, we step into the shower and sing a worship song to you, or we invite your presence as we wake up and start our day. Lord, let us be conscious of you. Let us be conscious of your nature. Now put a hand on your own heart and say, Lord, Holy, Holy Spirit, I welcome you. Do what you want. And Lord, I'm asking this morning that you would speak to us. Lord, that you would challenge us in new ways, that you would challenge the places of ourselves that we don't want to be challenged. (laughs) That's a dangerous prayer. Lord, that you would lead us into humility. You would lead us into your character. You would lead us to pick up our cross and follow you daily. Open our ears, open our hearts, open up our minds. May we be fertile ground. And may the seeds go deep this morning. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. The Lord's been stirring this this message in me for the last week and a half or so. The title of my message today is The Gong Show. Y'all ever watch that show? If you don't like that, if that's a little too edgy for you, you can call it The Noise of Lovelessness. Okay? The Gong Show. We're going to start today in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, please turn there with me. In this passage, in this, this book, Paul is addressing the church at Corinth for various matters, for different ungodly behaviors of division in the church, for sexual misconduct, for misunderstanding, uh, misunderstandings on food, sacrifice to idols, for different worship practices, and also for different beliefs on the, the resurrection of Jesus. And so Paul's addressing the church here 
And there's two big themes here in this book. He's, he's calling the church, his church, to this standard of integrity and morality as believers. How many know you have, you're called to a standard of integrity as a believer? Yes? Hallelujah. And also, there's this theme in this book of unity, of being unified under one Savior, under one Spirit. And so we're going to pick up a little later in the book, in, in chapter 12, and we're going to start down in verse 4. We're going to read a, little, a good portion of this, okay? The whole chapter, actually. Verse 4. Now, are there, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So right off the bat here, Paul is, Paul is reminding us of the ways that we have been uniquely gifted in Christ. And if you look all around this room, you look to your left and your right, you're going to find people that have been gifted by the Lord in different ways. Beautiful different ways. But there's this point, there's this thread that he begins to weave through here, and it carries on that it's by one spirit. It's by one God. Verse 12. For just as the body is one, can you say one? And as many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one, say one, body, so it is with Christ, for in, for in, Spirit, we were all baptized into body. Y'all are getting it. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. One, 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 one. Are we getting the message, right? Could Paul make this any clearer? Verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. Listen, your opinions of yourself don't determine your place in the body of Christ. Because if that was the case, you would be often less than, because we think of ourselves less than Christ does of us. Anyways, I digress, okay? <laughs> Verse 16, and if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would, the sense, where would be the sense of hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. I love this. This... This, as he's unpacking this beautiful imagery of us being the body of Christ. And our body has so many different parts that play pivotal roles, right? Pivotal, pivotal roles. But he's saying here, listen, he starts with this place of uniqueness and callings and different giftings. And he said, unity is not conformity, everybody. Unity is the, a celebrated diversity as we come together as one organism, amen? As we come together as one body. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. There's a word right there. If you've been thinking of yourself as a weaker part, you are indispensable to the body of Christ. My mom is a prayer warrior, man. She is indispensable to the body of Christ. She is an intercessor. She's been praying and praying and praying for us daily my whole life and declaring. Verse 23. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. 
and our unpresentable parts are treated, treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And I love this line. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. When's the last time we rejoiced together when a member was honored here? Verse 27 Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret but earnestly desire the higher gifts. And then he ends this. He foreshadows to the next chapter, and he ends with this line. He says, and I will show you still a more excellent way. All through this text, all through this chapter, is this beautiful celebration of the fact that we are different members of the body. That each one of us, you came today and you are uniquely gifted in Christ. That you have a purpose, he has a calling, he has giftings for you that he doesn't necessarily have for somebody else. And there's this invitation to be secure in our place in the body, right? To be secure with the place that we play because though we may think less of ourselves, we may play an indispensable place, we just don't know it. An indispensable part. And I love that he goes into this, the, almost into the offices, right? We found in Ephesians 4.11 of apostles and prophets and preachers and teachers, and pastors, sorry, and, and teachers and, and evangelists. And whilst I, I love that, I love the gifts of God to his church, to his body, I've been in rooms where, again, I'm like, do, have we, are we missing the point of this text? Because Paul says first apostles, and our humanity hears the word first, and I've been in meetings with ministry leaders where somebody from the front said, who feels called as an apostle? And almost every person in the room put their hand up. And I sat there grumpy with the Lord is the truth. I sat there grumbling with the Lord like, there's just no way. Statistically, there is no way, God. But our humanity, I'm not judging. I'm not saying that is the case. Maybe I really was in a room full of apostles. But is there this invitation where we miss the point and we just want to be first? God's the first apostle, so that's what I am. And again, it's just the striving for the the parts of the body that are seen. And we're longing and missing the point that we have a part to play that's beautiful and unique. And it's not about being the most visible. It's not about being whatever we think or or our flesh has decided is the most important thing. I believe in the, the gift of the office of the apostle. It's important in the church. But don't be anything less than who God made you to be. Why rob him of the destiny he created for you? The beautiful plan that he laid out for you. Tell somebody next to you, you have a place in the body of Christ. Tell them your job is really important. Excuse me. Excuse me. Paul's laying this groundwork for us, and then he says that line, I will still show you a more excellent way. And that's when we see little phrases like that, when you're reading your Bible, that should cause us to think, oh, what's he about to say? And there's this beautiful text we all know and love, or hopefully know in 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 1, he goes on to say, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. 
If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. <laughs> love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Come on, what a job description of the believers of Christ. Are we bearing all things, believing all things, hoping all things, enduring all things? When somebody wrongs us, are we believing the best in all things? Anyways, Woo. love never ends. Verse 8, as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. Then I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall fully know. I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. I love the radical nature. Like Paul is making this hard to ignore, right? If I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. If I have all mystery, understanding and knowledge of all mystery, and I have all faith, not some faith, but all faith to say, remove this mountain, but I have not love, I have nothing. If I get up here today, and I preach the best sermon you've ever heard or the whatever, but I have not love, Paul says this is all you're hearing. Jesus loves you. The call to the nature of Christ to walk in love is, is unmissable when you read the Bible of the higher way to follow him. And without it, without love, we're just a noisy gong. We're a clanging cymbal. You give all you have, all everything you have away, but without love, it's nothing. And I, I feel this like challenge as the Lord was stirring this, this message in my heart, like we have to put back on the, the, in the things that we're looking for in that we're looking for the character of Christ in, in one another. That we're looking for the character of Christ when we're choosing our friends, when we're choosing employees, when we're, when we're following leaders or pastors. I don't know about y'all, but when I hear like a prophet or a pastor or somebody and they don't have, I just don't discern that spirit of love, I find it hard to receive. Is that just me? Because the character of Christ matters more than the gifting. And if we go somewhere that only cares about our gifting, then they'll prostitute you for your gifting whilst not caring about you at all. But if you go somewhere that cares more about your character than your gifting, you're going to be somewhere where you're, do, you're, you're dearly loved. Because they're not trying to use and abuse you. They don't want you just for what you can give. But they love you. And they recognize that a body, this, this picture of unity is a beautiful thing. That we do get to bring our gifts, that we have been uniquely gifted, but by one spirit. And we come to one communion table and one Lord. It's like we've turned into Dory in Finding Nemo and it's like something shiny and we chase it. I will show you still a more excellent way. Our, our impact, our fruitfulness is dependent on our love. 
and the overflow of our wells, of the wells of our life, without love, you're just handing out poison. Jesus. John 17, 20, Jesus is praying and he says, I pray that, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. There's that word again. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. And then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. When will the world know that the Father sent his Son? When we love one another and are in unity. John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus is... He's finishing washing his disciples' feet. He knows the things that are to come. And the, the, the thing that is pressing on his heart that he has to get off his chest and tell his disciples is this. In verse 34, he says, A new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. 36, a lawyer who was also a Pharisee asked Jesus a question. He says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The importance of love, it's there. It's all through it. The importance of of having the nature of Christ, the man who is love, to be like the man of love, it's, it's there. The calling is there for us as believers, as his body. And I've been, over the last few years, I've been wrestling with his church, even during some of the political and the COVID season. One time I was at the gym at like 6 a.m. and the Lord said to me, do you still love my church? And I began to cry at the gym and I said, yes, Lord, I still love your church. Aaron, do you still love my people? Yes, Lord, I still love your people. And I was asking myself this question, if love is the defining characteristic, if love is the very thing that the world will know we are his disciples by, why do we have these public arguments? Why do we bicker and debate on social media? And make it public for the unsaved. We're not concerned about our witness. We're not concerned about our, them to, that the world would see our love for one another. And instead, we cast, thrown, uh, we cast stones and we tear people apart. And I mean, gossip and hatred and all of it has invaded the church, right? Because of humanity, where it's human nature. Or we, we leave churches because we're offended And we miss the part of the Bible that says, if your brother offends you, go to them and and tell them what they've done. And we care more about being right than being reconciled. It's like, where are we missing the call to love? To humble ourselves, to come down from our thrones, to stop trying to sit on the judgment seat because only God sits on the judgment seat. And to operate and live to the nature of Christ. Not that we're going to get it right every day, every moment, but that that's our aim. That's our goal. As believers, sometimes we skip that step, most especially of loving our enemies. 
and in, we curse them and we gossip about them and we slander about them and we say all kinds of wrong things. Love your enemies. I was watching this video on, on TikTok came up this week and it was this, this uh, self-identifying transgender man that was, had been so loved in his community by his church he would attend the prayer meetings and the worship meetings and all sorts of things. And so as he began to unravel in Christ and realize his identity and the love of the community, he's now got up before the church and said, I now want this church to start calling me as I was born to be as a woman. And my name is no longer Aiden, it's Jessica. And I'm like weeping and I'm like, Lord, would I be one of those that could love Aiden into Jessica? But most especially, would I be one that could love Aiden while they're Aiden? Lord, would we be the type of church that if Aiden walked in the door, we could love Aiden? If God said, love your enemies, well, they're not your enemy. They're a human being. So how much more can we love humanity and people who are lost and broken? Jesus, listen, Jesus didn't come for those who are whole. He came for the lost. He came for the sick. He came for the broken. He came for the prostitute. He came for the tax collector. He didn't come for those who thought they knew everything. So there is a call to love. Otherwise, we just end up being the symbols and the gongs of this world. How do we love? First and foremost, we, in order to love, we must know the man of love. The man who is love. God is love. We must spend time with him. We must spend time with the Lord in his presence and asking him, Lord, would you give me a heart for the world around me? Lord, would you give me your eyes to see? Would you give me your heart to feel? Would you, would you help me to see and hear and feel and touch the world like you did? Help me to walk in your ways, Jesus. Take away my scales. Take away my judgments. Take away my bitterness. Would you help me to love people right where they are like you did? Not to compromise myself, not to compromise my own self, but to still be able to love somebody just the way they are and where they're at. Listen, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Your fight is not against flesh and blood. Your fight is not against a political party that is filled with flesh and blood. And I'm not endorsing a side. I'm simply saying the call to love, to be the character and nature of Christ, even when we disagree, cannot be mistaken when you read the gospel. Show us how to love like you love, Jesus. We're also called to pray and bless those who curse us. That one's hard. I'm just going to be real. That one's hard. In our flesh, we want to curse those who curse us. We want to gossip about those who, who gossip about us, especially with our spouses. And Luke 6, 27 says, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks of you. And if anyone takes from what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. I ask us the question, have we forgotten how to be wronged? And again, we're just looking for retribution. We're looking to sit on that judgment seat and point the finger when we've been wronged. And I think of Jesus on the cross, having endured everything he endured, looking at these people who've judged him, who've beaten him, who've whipped him, who have every just sort of malice in their heart, mocking him. 
And he had every right as the son of God to condemn the world right then and there. And this was not some easy, beautiful moment. No, Jesus was praying, Lord, if it be thy will, would you take this cup from me? If there's any other way. And what does he pray? As he looks out over his condemners. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How do we love? We forgive as well. We forgive those who've hurt us. We forgive those who've cursed us. We forgive those who've mistreated us. We can't afford not to. And if, if, if we're called to forgive one another in the body of Christ, to, to, to walk in unity, how much more the world that doesn't know him? How much more to say, Father, forgive that business partner that, that cheated me out of the business, for they know not what they do. They don't know you. They don't have your morality, Christ, in them. Father, forgive that colleague that, that took away my promotion, that, le- that boss that didn't give me my promotion. They don't know you. We forgive, right? I mean, forgiveness is, is so fundamental. We forgive our kids <laughs> when they wrong us. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Forgive those who've hurt you. Forgive those who've wronged you. We also, we, we need to walk in repentance. When we, when we do miss the mark, right? And we do. We miss it. Sometimes we get it wrong. You know, with my kids, I get it wrong. Kids can drive you crazy. I got four. And there's times you got to go to them and you're like, I missed the mark. I'm really sorry. First, I typically first, I repent to the Lord. Lord, help me. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lord. And I have to go to my kids and I say, I'm really sorry. Daddy lost his temper. Daddy raised his voice. Can you forgive me? But we repent and we walk in repentance with the Lord when we miss the mark. We say, Lord, I'm so sorry. And even last night, Jess and I were basically ended up having a prayer meeting last night. We were going to go watch a show and we're like, I don't know, we put some worship on and then we just got sidetracked in the best possible way. And so we're worshiping and praying. Jess is dancing around. I'm laying on the floor with a blanket. And we start praying, and I'm just praying, Lord, would you help me to love my kids like you? Help me to be a good parent. Would you help me to be like you, Jesus? And just repenting for any way I missed the mark. And that's the call. That's the call to walk in love. Help me get it right next time, Lord. Lastly, we can't hide away. We can't live in our little bubbles, Christian bubbles. We're called to be not of the world, but what? In the world. And we didn't, we weren't just called to go and make disciples of the people we find tolerable. The sins that we can tolerate, but then there's the untouchables, and I want nothing to do with you. But go and make disciples of all nations. So don't hide away. Listen to people. Hear their stories. Spend time with your neighbors. Be friends with people that are different than you. Be friends with people who think differently than you. Be friends with the weird colleague that believes birds aren't real and the, I don't know. Paul's wearing his birds aren't real shirt today, so I had to make that joke for him. (laughs) Be friends with people who are different than you. You know, one thing I loved growing up, just a, a little testimony for my own life, was just some of my closest friends in high school coming to know Jesus. And it wasn't through preaching at them It wasn't through, like, trying to tell them what they were doing wrong. It wasn't through any of that. It was literally just 
if you're going to be my friend, this is a huge part of my life, and I'm not going to like hide that away from you. That's just kind of what it is to be my friend. And so they would come to our, our house, and we would have house church and play volleyball and eat food and have a good time. And, but also, like, we were going to talk about the Lord. <laughs> and eventually, they, like, there was something so attractive that they didn't see in their own families that they accepted Christ in their own lives. And so we're called to love and not at, not at the, the cost of, not, of compromising ourselves, but to fully be ourselves and yet fully love. And even when we need to speak the truth, how are we supposed to speak the truth? What does the Bible say? In love. In love. Would we be those that could speak the truth in love? And Jess and I, we've been praying. We've been talking with God. We've been saying, Lord, like, what, what do we want to see this community look like in the next 15, 20, 30 years? And I wrote down a few things I want to read to you. That we would be a a church of deep fellowship and love. That everyone would find their place, their family and their purpose and their friendships. That we would love one another and serve together. That we would model the life and acts of Jesus. That we would be known for our love. But we would be deeply after Jesus and his presence that we would see signs, wonders, and miracles, and that he would encounter us in new and incredible ways as we allow him into our lives and spaces, that we would mourn together, rejoice together, and hunger and thirst after him together. So let us not be the gong show of the world, everybody. Let us not be the clanging symbols of the world. But to follow Christ is to choose a higher path. To follow Christ is to not look like the world around you. And when you're at at the water cooler and everyone's gossiping about one another in your workplace, to not enter in. But to speak blessing and to speak love and to speak favorable. And to believe the best. Love hopes all things, endures all things, believes all things. And when you're offended, speak to your neighbor. But we are called to go in this opposite spirit of following Christ. Let's stand. If we could for a moment just focus on the Lord. Just put a hand on your own heart and ask the Lord, would you give me a heart of love? Lord, would you show me how to love my misbehaving teenager who wants nothing to do with you? Even though it's hard. Would you show me how to love my colleagues who think just totally different than me? I was just speaking with somebody after the first service that works at a prevalent university in public relations, and she's a believer, and it's like, how do I love these transgender and homosexual students coming in? Lord, show us how to love those that are different than us without compromising our, ourselves, with following in your ways, with, yes, thinking differently and, and recognizing that we are different, but let us take the calling to walk in your, your shoes of love. So just pray that simple prayer. Would you help me learn to love? And even right now, as the Lord just begins to Maybe bring up somebody that you've been struggling to love. Or maybe a group of people you've been struggling to love. 
maybe it's a political party or a boss or a, your kids or your grandparents or your parents. Just take a second and just repent, Lord. Would you forgive me for any way that I have not been like you and shown love and mercy and grace where I've been wronged? Would you forgive me for any way that I've judged? And would you help me to love them like you love them? God, I ask for that that enduring love that Paul was talking about, the love that endures even when we don't see the change. A love that's not dependent on an outcome, but a love that's dependent on our, our, our nature in Christ. Show us how to love like you.